Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Would you join me in welcoming uh, Dr. John Holmes, please? Hello. It's fun to be here with you all. I appreciate that. That introduction um, makes me sound smarter than I am. So it's like my mom wrote it, but um, she didn't. Anyway, um, I am looking forward to the theme here. We're uh, looking at times of refreshing, and I think we all need that. Uh, my wife my wife is here. She's, uh, she's, she's special, but not in the sense that my teachers used to call me special, if you know what I mean. Anyway, she is really a treasure, and uh, she just passed her real estate license, so she's, if you have any connections with that, you can talk about that. If you like good tools, remodeling, you can talk to me and her, because we, we've kind of been in that for a while, and, and uh, we, we have a lot of fun doing that. So I'm looking forward to this, but um, thank you for the invitation. John um, Wetzig used to be my youth pastor when I was like a kid, and when he contacted me about coming here, I'm like, do, do you not remember? I'm, but Okay. <laughs> Sure. It's just a testament of God's grace, right? Have you ever met somebody and then you're, you're away for like 20, 30 years, but in your head, there's still that like, and then they change? That's what's going on here, right? God's grace comes in, the power of God's word over time uh, in, 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 uh, changes us. And that's just, that's exciting. So thank you for that invitation. And thanks, John and Debbie, for your, your years of faithful work and, and, um, the, the, working with junior high kids is, is a special gift, so that's great. Thank you for doing that. Um, let's see if I can turn this deal on here and uh, show you a couple, couple things. Yeah, this is our family. So we have um, Jesse as our son on the left. He married Megan, and then Micah, the guy in the middle, is our other son, and he married Ashley, and then Don is there, and I'm on the right. My name's John. Hi. Glad to be here tonight. So, um, great family. Our kids are, are fun. They married great women, and they both live in town. We're from Omaha, Nebraska, and so uh, we've already found some Nebraska contingents here, and that's good. But um, I spent about 25 years at higher education, and so I taught every year and also had like a full-time administrative load, and so it was kind of a double, uh, a double deal there, and um, it was good. I just, I love God's Word. I, I, I have since, I remember 10th grade, just kind of you're memorizing it and speaking it into a cassette tape. Those are things that, anyway. And so um, that, that is, um, that's good. It's just we're, we're glad to have these guys here with us in Omaha. But um, so, yeah, I taught at Grace, and um, my wife and I would take uh, a small group of students to Colorado and go backpacking every year. And Jeff was on a, one of those trips, uh, Jeff Schneider, and I don't think anyone else here. But anyway, and um, Rock climbing, we love the outdoors, we love that kind of stuff, and just connecting uh, with people outdoors. And so it's fun because you're driving all the way to Colorado with kids in the van, and they start making fun of all the other professors. I'm like, I'm here, like, you know that, right? And, and so then I'm like, well, okay, do me, what do I do? And it's quiet. Oh, no, really, what do I do? And so this one kid, he's kind of funny animated, he's, he's like, well, you, you get real excited, your eyebrows go up, and then you say, what, what was I talking about? Which is really true. Anyway, I've, I've been working at that, and so I'm, um, I, I've been a pastor now for three years. So, so Grace closed, and I had been there for 25 years, and you know, the whole interim president thing, they just wanted somebody that was familiar, that would kind of provide a little bit of emotional comfort, and so um, uh, and then the, the board wrapped it up, and, and we went on. So um, I am a pastor now, lead pastor in Omaha at Grace Life Bible Church. Love it. We've got a great board, great people, great team, small little church, you know, 120 people and part-time staff. But um, it's really a sweet season, and, and it's good. We're seeing lives changed, marriages uh, deepened and healed, and, um, um, and that's a win, right? So that's, that's what we're about. So, yeah, I've been a pastor for three years, which means I've got a couple more years before <laughs> I saw that on the Internet. I just thought it was funny, all right? Anyway, so seriously, we'll move, on. we'll move past that. But yeah, times of refreshing come from spending time in God's presence. But where, where do we and where do we as a culture look for refreshment? 
where do we look for that which fills us up, right? I mean, we have a lot of choices. A lot of things are coming at us. Do this, buy this, have this. You know what I mean? Subscribe to that. Drive this, wear this, eat that, don't eat, whatever. It's just, it's just this noise that's constantly coming. And it can make, you, you look at that and you're like, right, that's kind of basic. But yet somehow, when we leave here and we get back to our normal routine, it gets complicated. Why can't we find rest and peace and contentment in the presence of the Lord. One reason is because we're so busy, everything's beeping at us, we don't have time to spend time in God's presence. And so we're, that's just like a lifetime goal to work on that, right? Because we live in a funny culture. So this is where we're going. And um, so I'm just going to zip through the, all five sessions. You won't remember this, but it makes me feel good. So just endure it, okay? So the first one tonight, a time in God's presence allows us to recognize the provision and protection that our good shepherd provides and responding to by joyfully, willingly spending time in his presence. That's what we're talking about tonight, Psalm 23. Tomorrow, we'll take a look at this. Time in God's presence allows us to experience the grace and forgiveness that confession brings and extend it to others. So can you extend something you haven't experienced? Hmm, that's interesting. We'll talk about that. Next one, uh, time in God's presence allows us to grow and change in character relating to others through relational grace instead of relational revenge. That's practical. And then four, time in God's presence gives us the wisdom to integrate our life with God in our relationships with other people before we seek to impact them. That's just another nice way of saying don't manipulate and nag people to death, okay? That's what that's about. And then finally, it allows him to change our perspective from our comfort to his kingdom. So um, it really all centers on time in God's presence. So there's a, um, and, and here's the whole thing again, yeah, recognize and respond, Psalm 23. If, if I said to you, familiarity breeds contempt, and we're in Psalm 23, and my guess is a lot of you are like, oh, great, I know that. I'm there's nothing new. Yeah, there's, there's always something. It's God's word, right? It's not like a poem I'm going to read to you from Ann Landers or something, okay? It's God's word. There's always something there. So this is what we're doing. Recognizing the provision and protection that our good shepherd provides and responding. One of my big things that, that themes at our church is, is that we respond to his kindness, right? And so we respond to that. And, uh, and we respond, and we, we have to recognize his provision and his protection. And if you don't recognize that, it makes it hard to respond to his goodness, right? If we're oblivious to his goodness, how, how can we respond? So we have to take a look. My dad, he lived with us for years. He passed away a little over a year ago. Great, godly man. And um, he kept, you know, um, he had a journal going back to like 1888. It was his mom started, not him, but anyway. And so, you know, he would type and type and type, and then kind of an old big farmer guy, and he would, he would accidentally hit control A and then keep typing. Yeah. And then he would get nervous, so he would save it, <laughs> which means it's gone. So I got in the habit of like every week going in there and capturing what I could and saving it and backing it up. One of the files on his computer was God's grace heritage for our family. He had over the years written just evidence of stories of God's grace over decades. This is this story, how God was kind to us. This is the, you know what I mean? It's just great. I thought, well, that's, that's a good idea. It's not rocket science. It's just a good idea, right? So, okay, so that's that. Um, there's this book I read, and um, it's called With, um, and it, it has really shaped and informed me. Um, the, the, I'll, I'll refer to this throughout the, the multiple sessions, but I just wanted to start with this concept, so when I talk about it, you're like, okay, I, I got you. The idea is that we are designed and built to walk with Jesus, right? In, in intimate relationship with him, he desires that, we desire, but, but yet in our world, in our culture, we, we can gravitate to one of four kind of extreme postures in our walk with God. Um, one of them is, is over 
God, where, where we look at God, Christianity, God's word as, as well, yeah, th- th- it's principles, principles to control my marriage. I want my kids to be good, so I read the Bible. I go to church because I want this, okay? All right, it, it's, it's principles to control, and I'm kind of an academic guy, and that's kind of where I drift. You know, I read stuff, I'm like, one, two, three, here's a card. If you want a happy life, one, two, three. And it, it's like, it's not going to work that way, but I'm just telling you, you know, I, I can go there pretty quick. Okay, another one off to the right is called From God, and that's people that, that just focus on the blessings and gifts, and, and, and you follow Jesus because of what you get from it. And not so much with him, but you get blessings from him. Okay? And the, the one down here, Under God, Morality to Obey and Avoid Calamity. You better, because if you don't, smack you. You know, you're afraid, all right? And, and so that's that whole thing. And you probably know some people who fear is their dominant deal. And over on the left, um, for God, mission. Are you going to go? Huh? You going to go? Honduras? You going to go? B- Belize? Where are you going to go? We got to go. Mission. Let's go. Go, go, go. And, and there's nothing really inherent wrong with any one of those four things, right? Only when we leave Jesus and we no longer are enjoying life with him, and we focused on one of those four. Did that make sense? So it's just more, it's a kind of a degree thing. It's not all or nothing. So I need that reminder to come back and go, okay, I, I want to walk with Christ and, and not just make outlines, right? Okay, so we'll move on from there, and we'll come back to that later, but that's, that's something going where we're going. Okay, so thank you, uh, Pastor Bill, for reading Psalm 23. Yeah, let's take a look at this. If you have your phones or Bible, um, dig into Psalm 23. We're going to kind of move through it verse by verse. And I don't know if you caught it when Bill read it, or I don't know if you've noticed this. You probably have. But there's three future tense statements that really shape the whole thrust of this psalm. Did you catch him when he read that? First one is pretty simple. First verse, I shall not want, right? Okay, I shall not want. And so, so there's a sense of provision that God gives and, and there's contentment, all right? The second one, moving on down here to verse four, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will fear no evil, all right? So I will fear no evil for you are with me. Isn't that interesting? Okay, oh, so it's not that I have a magic book or I took a seminar or whatever else. It's his presence. Times of refreshing comes from the presence of God, and it's also protection. He is with us. doesn't mean we're never going to get into that valley of death. It just means he's with us when we go. All right, the last one, I shall return and dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and this is really sweet. So three statements. I will fear no evil. First one, I shall not want. I will will fear no evil, and I will spend time with him because he is good. You see that? He's responding. He's responding to the goodness of God. He's provided for me. He's protected me. I want to spend time with him. Boom. That's where we're going, okay? So that's what we're doing here. Uh, Romans 2.4. I'm just going to read this. Uh, Don't zip over there. I won't be there long. Paul says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and the forbearance and patience, not knowing, here it is, that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? See the, that response. His kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Isn't that interesting? And then you zip over to Titus 2, which just blows my mind. I, 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 I've been studying this verse, and, and I feel like I'm like 2% there. I mean, I, I don't understand much of it. I really am hungry to understand more of this verse. Here's the verse. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. I get that part. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. My question is, how does grace train us? Take that one home with you. Talk about it at lunch tomorrow or breakfast and just, just explore it. I don't have all the answers. You know, if you come up with something good, let me know. How does grace train us? I think it goes back to that Romans idea of his kindness. It's just irresistible. I mean, you come up to a holy God and you're short and you know I don't belong here. I should be kicked out. And his kindness paves the way. Welcome. Here's your ticket. Jesus Christ. And you're like, yeah, I, I want 
to spend time with you and, and, and that response. So um, when we go to Psalm 23, uh, David wrote this, and uh, he's a little shepherd boy out doing his thing. And my question with David is, you know, we know David as the king, pretty, you know, good king, um, a dark chapter, but pretty good king. And how does he, how does he get there? Because he didn't grow up as like the leader of the brothers, you know, they're like, you know, hey, is this all your guys? Yeah, pretty much. Well, it's just, you know, this, the guy out here. But anyway, here are the guys. Uh, go get, go, you know, the shepherd. So he's, David is doing something out with in the field in the wilderness that molds his heart that captures God's attention. And, and that was just daily meditating and communing and worshiping and praying and seeing how sheep work and then going, hey, I'm a sheep, right? And, and you're the shepherd. And so David is processing all this over many, many days and many years. I have this saying I used to tell my students, it's, it's a bit overstated, but when you're teaching 18-year-olds, you just overstate stuff, right? So it's this, you are the sum total of many small decisions over many small days. You look in your, where you are now is because of what's in your rearview mirror. And I know there's other events we don't control, other people make decisions that blow our lives up, I get that, but generally speaking, okay, um, I make a lot of decisions day by day by day, and they all add up to who I am and who I'm not. Isn't that interesting? David was making daily decisions, shaping his character, and God said, I want him because of his daily decisions, all right? So um, here's, a, here's a thought experiment. This, this is how to really drive this point home, and I think you'll get this. Um, Let's just take yesterday. Who would you become in one year if for the next year you just repeated everything you did yesterday? See what I'm You get my point now, right? If you're so busy, there's no time in God's word. Well, now a year of that. Who are you? You freak out and do something, okay? And, and that's kind of a frightening thought, but, and it's a bit silly, but you get my point. Um, is, yeah, they all add up, don't they? And the people, athletics, business, people who really seem to, to master life have mastered that ability to capture the mundane moments and invest them in something. And we want to invest them in God's word and, and, and walking with Jesus, right? Little bits, little bits, little bits, and they all add up. So uh, this is what I'm talking about with David doing that, and here's a quote. Um, what does it... What a man does when he's alone with his thoughts will decide what he is when he's in public with other people. It is there that either by self-indulgence a man's character is wrecked or by self-discipline a man's character is made. Alone with God, David meditated and nourished his soul in the Lord. That's what I'm talking about, okay? Good stuff, good quote. Alan Redpath. Um, so, um, Jill Briscoe said, the management of time is the management of self. So if I'm wasting time, I'm wasting myself. Interesting. All right. And don't get too carried away. It's still okay to go for a walk, right? Have you know? Okay. Um, all right. So um, moving on here. So David, chapter or number one here. I shall not want because of the character and knowledge of my good shepherd. He provides for me. Now sheep are kind of. Um, Sheep are kind of dumb, right? And so this is my, my wife grew up on a farm in Minnesota. She's a triplet in a small town, which is cool because, you know, she turned three years old and then it's in the newspaper. The triplets are three, you know what I mean? Anyway, so um, this is her farm and it's a granary. And, and, and then if you don't know farming, um, I'm kind of a city kid, so I, I, I learned. But the, the granary is where there's a, a steel mesh grate on the floor and a, and a funnel-like shaped um, place underneath with an auger, so a truck drives in, dumps grain, it goes through the steel grate into the, the giant pit, and then the auger turns and moves the grain up into a leg and down into the, into the grain silos. Okay, that's, that's how that works. Well, what had happened is somebody, that, that door, somebody had left it open the day before a pig went in there and kind of smelled the grain and nosed the steel grate up and moved it. And this guy knows where I'm going already. And then, um, so they had uh, about 50 sheep. 
And her brother one morning looks out and only sees like 25 or so. He's like, half of them are gone. And he's like, where are, where are, the, where are the sheep? And, and so he's running all over the place and he can't find the sheep. And then he goes into the granary. And one sheep had walked through the doors and fell into the pit. And another sheep behind that sheep walked in the door, still in the pit. And I won't keep going because you can see it. 28 sheep. It was full. Six of them on the top lived because they're at the top level. The others died. And, and, and you're like, Scripture calls us sheep. I'm like, really, Lord? Not even like a dumb dog? Sheep? Man, that hurts. And so um, another occasion, I was with her brother, and we're driving around, and he had, he had to go get a sheep for whatever reason. I don't know. And he, he had this big old Bonneville. It's one of those old cars that's the size of, size of a yacht. I mean, you could sleep three people in the trunk. Anyway, we drive up to this sheep to get it, and he just walks up to it. And the sheep, have you ever seen fainting goats? It wasn't a fainting sheep, but it just, it just, knocked, it just fell over. Just like, like a gust of wind, like boop. And I go, what was that? He says, oh, that's, that's its defense mechanism. I'm like, Great. You know what I mean? It's not going to work well. So he picks it up by the, the feet, throws it in the trunk, slams the trunk, and we drive off and, you know, take the sheep to wherever it goes. But anyway, so sheep are, um, are problematic. And so scripture, listen to this, Psalm 95, he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And... Um, so I'll just, I'll just let that stay. God is, saying, or God is saying through David as he writes this that um, uh, he's the shepherd, and we can learn a lot about the sheep, what's going on here. Let's go to verse 1. I shall not want to. So the first principle, uh, your shepherd dictates the direction and the quality of your life. It, who you follow, where you end up is determined by who you follow, right? If, if you're on a path, I've, I live in Nebraska, so I got on I-80 and went west. I never got to Philadelphia. What's up with that? Those dumb signs? No, I was on the path that went west. The sad thing in life is so many people are on a path, and it leads them to an inevitable destination, and they get there, and they blame God. It's like, well, this, this, this is where the path goes. You didn't want to get to Weed, California. Shouldn't have gone on that path. See what I'm saying? Okay, and I know there's other, there's other factors with that. But here's a question. Who is your shepherd, and can your shepherd deliver life, peace, and provision? Okay? That's what we're talking about. Um, I'm going to kind of blow your mind here. This might rock your world, but that's okay. I'm going to leave Wednesday. <laughs> Everybody makes disciples. Christians, non-Christian, everybody makes disciples. Now, a couple of people know where I'm going with this. Technically, the word disciple simply means a follower, a learner. Scripture says the Pharisees had their disciples, okay? Their followers are learners. So what I mean by that, I'm zooming out. I'm simply saying in our culture, some people are disciples of Ford trucks. Some people are disciples of fishing. Some people are a disciple of mountain biking, kind of tempting to me, but I'll take Jesus. You know what I mean? So, so everybody, everybody points to someone or something that says, that's where you find life. That's, where, that's what it's all about. That's where meaning is. Everybody makes disciples. We are called to make disciples of Jesus. That makes sense? In the broad sense. Okay. So the question is, who are you following? Uh, are you following an imposter shepherd who is going to steal, kill, and destroy? Or are you going to follow the only good shepherd who gives his life for you? Listen to this. I'm going to scan down through John 10. You, you know this passage, but I'm just going to zip through some of these phrases. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I came that they would have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. I lay down my life for the sheep. There is one flock, one shepherd. The father loves me because I lay my life down. I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down. He's dying for his sheep. Does your shepherd die for you? Does he give, does it or he or she give you life, or does it take life from you. So, 
Um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There's that contentment theme coming up here, and the contentment comes from the character of the shepherd, right? Doesn't mean we're never going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It just means when we're there, we're not alone. That's really important. Some Christians, some branches of, of Christianity kind of have a weird view of suffering that, that, oh, if you're suffering, you are defective. Now, watch what happens. If I was the enemy, I would really like that strategy because what happens, very subtle, you, you, you're, you're worshiping, you're singing hymns, you got the Bible, and, and subtly your eyes go from the finished work of Jesus onto yourself. Brilliant move from the enemy. I, I must not have, I must, I, 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 me, right? And we don't feel adequate. Paul says we're not. So we keep our eyes on the finished work of Jesus and um, deal with those barrages of emotions that, uh, that tell us we're, we're not enough. And we go back to the finished work of Jesus. He says he is enough and I'm in him, right? So Philip, I appreciate your, your, your word earlier. Yeah, I don't have it all figured out either. And I'm a pastor. Where do pastors go to say, I don't have it figured out, right? Because we're supposed, to, this is where we go. We have fellowship, we have camaraderie, and um, Jeff is a buddy of mine, and we get together, and it's like, which way do I go? It, it's good stuff. All right. Anyway, so um, you, you, it doesn't mean, when, when he says, I shall not want, it doesn't mean you'll never have a lack, right? It simply means he's with you in every season. You, it's possible to, have a lack, and be right in the middle of the will of God. It's possible to have little and still be content and to still be refreshed by the presence of the Lord. I remember I worked in the Black Hills in college, um, ministry job, kind of building stuff in the Black Hills. And um, there was, I, we did VBS. I drive the van around you know, Keystone, South Dakota, and there's this one just impoverished shack the whole blue tarp on the, you're the junk everywhere. And this kid, he hadn't bathed in like months, would come out to get in the van. And his name was Trigvi. I've never forgotten that because I'm like, who does that? Who names, <laughs> when escaped. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they got her. So um, this kid's name was Trigvi. And this, this kid came out just glowing with love and acceptance and, and security and stability. And his mom would hug him and said, oh, Trigby, I love you so much. Have so much fun at VBS. And I thought, wow, there's some kids down the street living in a shack. I mean, living in a mansion that, that don't have that love. You know what I mean? And so um, that was cool. I think he's only like five years old. Anyway, um, so here's a quote I read. I'll just read it to you. I shall not want means that in the midst of suffering and even physical want, we shall not lack the expert care, love, and management of our good shepherd. So, um, he is with us. All right? So, verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures beside still waters. Now, if you go backpacking, you, you, you know that... Um, the fast rushing water carries the sediment and the junk in it. So you want to still, not stagnant, but, you know, kind of a calm so that all the, the sediment can settle down. You want still water. So here, it's talking about still waters is, is the good water. Now, sheep are weird for a lot of reasons, but there's four things that just freak them out of their ever-loving mind, and they just can't do what they're supposed to do. One is fear. If there's any threat, real or imagined, they just won't eat. They won't drink. So the shepherd has to take care of whatever they might be afraid of, okay? Aggravation. If there's any sense of aggravation within the, the, the flock, the shepherd has to deal with that. Tension. If there's any tension, um, social behavior, whatever's going on, the flock won't rest. And hunger. If they're hungry, they're, they're restless and they, they, won't, they won't behave. So the, the shepherd knows the terrain. He knows where to go. He knows where not to go. He knows where the good water is. Does your shepherd know where the good water is? Who are you following? Is it able to sustain you and give you life, or is it taking your life? Our culture has a lot of gods that take our lives. Verse 3. Now, this is tricky. This is where it starts to get deep. He restores 
Okay, wait. We just talked about water and green grass. So I'm kind of expecting what to be restored. If I'm drinking water and eating good food, I'm expecting my body to be restored. What does it say? He restores my soul. That's interesting. He leads me in paths of righteousness for the sheep's sake. Oh, there we go. No. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. A shepherd's reputation is determined by the condition of his flock. You, you look at the flock and you're like, you're a good shepherd. I can tell. Or you look at the flock and you're like, dude, you're an idiot. What, what are you doing? Where are you taking? Where are you feeding these sheep? Uh, I was just playing on my phone. I forgot to feed them. Yeah. Okay. You get it. So. Sheep are notorious, here's a quote, sheep are notorious creatures of habit. If left to themselves, they will follow the same trails in, until they become ruts, graze the same hills until they turn to desert wastes, pollute their own ground until it's covered with disease and parasites. Many of the world's finest sheep ranges have been ruined beyond repair by overgrazing, poor management, and indifferent sheep owners. We need a shepherd. <laughs> we're just like this. We'll just keep going back to the same thing, right? And, and uh, we need a shepherd to either use the rod or the staff. I'll explain those in a minute, but to help us transition, all right? All right, it's for his name's sake. We want to stay close to that good shepherd, all right? So number two, I will not fear evil because I'm protected by the presence of my good shepherd. I mentioned that before. It's not because he gave us a pamphlet or a magic hat or whatever else. It's his presence, and he is with us 24-7. The good, the bad, anywhere you are, he is present with us. Even, verse 4, in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Well, that's interesting. So, the, the shepherd's... Yeah, this is where shepherds live. This is, I went to Israel in 2000. It was like Y2K. Everyone was kind of, you know, freaking out. Um, anyway, this, it's, this is, it's a steep terrain, and you got to know where you're going as, as, a, uh, as a shepherd, all right? So, you know, hills around the corner could be life or death, a, a good fountain or a poison fountain. So shepherd principle number two, the presence of my good shepherd inspires confidence and contentment when darkness and uncertainty surround me. And we're so tempted to go to Facebook or go to a seminar or get another book or just get coffee or whatever, right? But, but really what we need is time in God's presence. Shut off the phone, get quiet, and get ready for all the junk to start pouring out. Honestly, I'm kind of a task-oriented guy, and so as soon as I'm quiet, like 30 seconds into it, I've got 14 things I forgot to do. So I just have a piece of paper next to me. I just write them down. Get them out of my head on paper. They're there when I'm done, right? Otherwise, I'm like, uh, I, you know, I, I get confused kind of easily. So, right? But, but just, just, just fighting for that rest and fighting for that time in God's presence, okay? So um, is your life marked by peace or by panic? You go through the valley of the shadow of death with, because we're all going to go through a valley. You're going you're to be with the shepherd or without the shepherd. I vote for going with the shepherd, right? So fear is one of those things that the sheep, the sheep um, struggle with. Now, there's a ton of things to be afraid. There's way more things to be afraid of than I ever knew. I Googled it. Things to be afraid of. It's just nuts. Like, like 89 things. And, and there's official words for them. Like, Cathisophobia. No one here has this. It's the fear of sitting. Bibliophobia. Fear of books. Well, get a Kindle. So, listen to this one. Sophophobia. Sophos wisdom. Fear of learning. I think I had some of those students. Anyway, um, there's this other one here called tripophobia, and it's fear of small round holes. Seriously, there is a, there's an issue in our culture with the iPhone with those three holes on the back. Some people, they just get the EBGBs. It bothers them. They can't handle it, and, and it's just three holes. And the, the lotus head, you've seen the lotus head? This really drives them nuts. 
They just, they just can't handle it. It's a thing. It's a real thing. So um, anyway, so fear, fear is something that we need to, um, you need to think right about that. You don't want to think, oh, I'm defective because I'm afraid. You bring it to the shepherd, submit to him, look for his rod or his staff, and, um, and, and move forward. Now, the rod, the rod, think of a baseball bat, okay? Whack. Now, the baseball bat, he, they could throw it and, and hit a wolf at a distance or smack the sheep. But there's also the staff, and this, I like the staff. I've, I've, always, I've always wanted to respond to the staff before the rod was necessary. You get it? The staff, the shepherd would walk along, and he would just take the staff and, and gently put pressure on the side of the sheep. We're, we're going this way. John, we're going this way. John, this way. Whap. You know what I mean? Lovingly. Okay? Discipline is a thing, right? And so, so respond to the staff before the rod is necessary, but they comfort because behind it is love, behind it is care, behind it is the good shepherd saying, you, you go this way, there's a wolf, there's a cliff, and there's poison water. You, you don't want to go that way, so the shepherd guides us, all right? So the direction always determines your destination. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is kind of a shift here. He shifts the metaphor from the shepherd to a banquet. Now, if you're eating before your enemies, look at this. In the presence of my enemies, that's rest and protection. You have the time to just sit in front of your enemies and just eat? You're safe, okay? You're provided for. So that's good. Again, remember, fear, agitation, Tension and hunger are things that, that the sheep can't handle quite well. All right, let's go to number three. Because my shepherd abundantly provides and protects me, I will return and dwell in the presence of my good shepherd forever. And so that's awesome, but this is interesting. Um, return? Doesn't that mean he departed? Yeah, it means he departed. We just read that here, I think, I, got a, I took a picture of it. That's the, the, the song, prone to wander, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for the courts above. So I don't know what's going on here. Was David in need of a spiritual renewal? Um, was he physically separated from, from the place of worship? But somehow he's like, I got to return and I can relate to that. Often, it's just life just throws at you several days that turn into weeks of busyness, and before you know it, where, where, where's my Bible, right? Exaggerating, but you get my point, okay? We just get busy, okay? Prone to wander. So maybe, maybe he had just drifted, and his attention got scattered. Maybe he was afraid of something. Maybe uh, he saw green grass on the other side of the hill, and he's like, oh, it's, it's really not green, right? I need to return. So he's returning uh, to the house of the Lord, all right? So my question for you today is, is where are you looking for provision? Where are you looking for protection? And are you able to see specific examples of how God has been good to you? Like my dad wrote down, God's grace heritage. Because only when you identify, yeah, he protects, he provides, can you really respond? You don't, you don't want to respond out of a vacuum. We respond when, yes, he is good. So, so we focus on his goodness, and we respond to that. Um, are you running from God? Running to him? Running from him? So we are sheep, and the good shepherd loves you. Are you responding by running from his love or towards his love? Respond to the staff before the rod is necessary, right? All right. I shall not want because of the character and knowledge of my good shepherd who provides for me. I will fear no evil because I am protected by the presence of my good shepherd. And because my good shepherd provides and protects me, I will return from wherever we need to return and dwell with him. It's that with aspect. I am enjoying life with him. I'm not just trying to get provision from him. Oh, that's part of the package, but he is the prize. That makes sense? And we can, e we can easily get that mixed up. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say by recognizing the provision 
and the protection that our Good Shepherd provides, we respond by joyfully, willingly, safely, and securely spending time in his presence. Why wouldn't we want to do that? So where, where I come from, we always end with some key questions because life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and take a look around, you could miss it. We want to we ask some key questions. Here are some key questions. Who is your shepherd? Who are you following? Who do you point to and say that's where life and fulfillment is? Hopefully it's Jesus. Is the presence of your shepherd inspiring confidence and contentment in your heart? Is your life marked by peace or by panic? Some days, I know, it's either or, right? How are you responding to the provision and protection of God? Are you running towards him or away from him? And so before we move on in this conference, we really need to get, get down right that everything else with the presence of God rests on our proper response to who he is. We don't want to fall into the manipulation deal where we're trying to get this from God and make him do that and bargain. So, so uh, I like Psalm 23 because it reminds me that the, the, the key to walking with God is to identify his goodness and just respond to that. So I'm going to pray, and um, you can take these questions and write a paper by Wednesday. <laughs> Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for Psalm 23. Thank you for little David out in the wilderness just making good decisions about his thoughts, his words, his time, his heart, his character, worshiping you, loving you, walking with you. And day after day, week after week, he becomes the king, not because he's the firstborn, but because he loves you and you love him. We want to love you. We want to respond to your goodness. So thank you for loving us first. We love because you first loved us. And um, may you bless the, the evening and tomorrow and uh, just all the relationships that are going on here. And mostly we just invite the Spirit of God to work and uncover whatever needs to be uncovered that you can address so that we can be closer to you and um, you can work in us and through us. Amen.